Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for day three of the Military History and Armed Forces Symposium here at Discovery Park of America. This is our first panel of the day, uh, hosted by uh, Major General William Malone, and he will be speaking with a few members of the 194th Engineer Brigade out of Jackson about their recent deployments. Major General Malone uh, retired in 2012 from, from the Army, and he was Assistant Adjutant General of the Tennessee National Guard. He was responsible for tr the training and supervision of more than 10,600 soldiers in uh, the Tennessee Army National Guard. In this capacity, he commanded the Tennessee Army National Guard and is responsible for readiness and effective, was responsible for readiness and effectiveness in training, administration, and logistics for both state and federal missions. Uh, so without further ado, Major General William Malone. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate all of you coming out today on such a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I want to uh, first recognize uh, my good friend, Glad Ca uh, Lieutenant General Glad Castellaw, who will be speaking to you later as a fellow UTM uh, graduate from many years in the past. And I want to welcome you to the Discovery Park Military History and Armed Forces uh, Symposium. I hope all of you have had the opportunity this weekend to look at the numerous exhibits, the uh, displays and the unique events that have been uh, offered uh, this weekend. I want to thank uh, Dixie Gunworks and Union City Coca-Cola for sponsoring th this event. Let me ask uh, the audience, are any members of the audience uh, veterans here today? Great. Any, are any of you currently serving in the armed forces? Good. Do you have family members who are serving it or have served in the armed forces? Great. Thank you for your service. <clears throat> Today we have a panel discussion about the current missions of our Tennessee National Guard. Our panel members uh, all serve in the 194th Engineer Brigade, where I served for more than 20 years. The Engineer Brigade is headquartered in Jackson, Tennessee, and the, the local uh, National Guard unit here in Union City, the 913th Engineer Company, is a member of the 194th Engineer Brigade. As many of you may know, the National Guard is a unique opportunity to have a civilian occupation of your choice, and plus you can also serve the state and the federal government in times of war and peace, civil disturbances, natural disasters, humanitarian aid such as currently in COVID-19 relief, and in disaster preparedness. I want to, my wife Sharon's with me here. I live, we live in Martin. We have uh, four daughters and six grandchildren, and I'm glad that she was able to be with us today. We have a very distinguished panel. Uh, in addition to the, these officers in their civilian uh, capacity, we have the chief counsel for the regulatory boards of the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance, Colonel Glandorf, a senior credit officer for the Security Bank, uh, Bank Corp of America, excuse me, of Tennessee, Captain Martin, and a healthcare, uh, HCA healthcare project manager, Lieutenant. They will discuss their experiences in overseas deployments, uh, securing our national cap nation's capital during the inauguration, the uh, tornado uh, relief, and uh, civil disturbance in Nashville uh, recently. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Glandorf. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Tony Glandorf. I'm the operations officer for the 194th Engineer Brigade. Um, and I, uh, uh, just, just briefly, uh, in the civilian career, I am a, I'm an attorney uh, with the Department of Commerce and Insurance um, um, in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, is where I reside. Um, however, I've been in the National Guard for uh, approximately 22 years now, and I'm an engineer in the National Guard. And um, so, uh, our engineer brigade, uh, what we have, um, what we did on our past missions, um, most recently, um, is that we went to uh, Kuwait um, in uh, August of 2019, and we came back um, approximately uh, September, August, September 2020. We were gone for approximately a year. Um, and, and what we did there is we did a, we were a theater engineer brigade, and we did theater engineering construction in the whole of the Middle East, including Iraq and Afghanistan. 
Um, and so, so what that means in probably simpler terms is that we had about 2,000 soldiers and we, um, we were a headquarters to oversee all construction operations that happened in the Middle East, Army, Army construction in the Middle East, including Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And, and, it, and it, um, it created a, a, a strange dynamic where we were headquartered in Kuwait, um, where we worked for uh, Central Command, uh, specifically Arsent, that controlled uh, an area for uh, Operation Spartan Shield, is what it was called. And it made up of the countries of Kuwait, um, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Qatar, uh, UAE, Bahrain, there may have been a few more. Um, and so we did all the construction operations that was there. And so that, that would entail um, anything for those military bases that we would have there in Kuwait. We could do construction on those bases to help out U.S. military facilities and whatnot. Operational maintenance at those locations also. Um, if they had a surge of personnel that were there, we could build and construct more areas there. Um, but also we did expeditionary construction when it was necessary in order to do um, force protection measures. So um, if you all remember when, uh, when Iran um, started to have aggression over in the Middle East back last January, um, uh, you, you probably saw where they shot rockets into Saudi Arabia. Well, they were shooting rockets into Saudi Arabia to be able to show that they could hit these oil uh, refineries and facilities and whatnot, and we just happened to have military personnel that were there. So we were over there and we were building uh, force protection measures so that we could um, set up um, and, and protect our own troops and our air bases that were there. And so we were doing that um, constantly from January forward, and it's still being done uh, now there uh, today. And so um, that was one of, the, one, of the, one of our bosses that we worked for there was Central Command. And on top of that, we also had troops that were um, in Iraq um, that were also doing force protection measures in Iraq. Um, you might have also uh, seen while we were there, you know, in, in the January time frame that Iran was shooting missiles into Iraq and whatnot. Um, and so we did have um, a substantial number of people that were there in Iraq at Al-Assad Air Base um, where those missiles did hit. Nobody was uh, physically injured, uh, though I think the... Uh, the, 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 the traumatic brain injuries were ones that came in um, later from that. Um, but we were building these force protection measures, like these radar systems that could help intercept and, and whatever those missiles. But that was work for, that was for a, a different boss that we had to work for over there, um, which was specifically Iraq and then, um, and then Syria at the same time. So, so our troops also did route clearance um, in Syria um, that, uh, that helped with um, with, with clearing um, any, you know, IEDs that are on the side of the road, if everybody remembers the IEDs from years past or whatnot. Um, and then the, the third boss that we worked for is with in Afghanistan, and um, in Afghanistan, which was Operation Freedom Sentinel, um, they were doing more of consolidation of bases and whatnot for the, um, the, the ongoing mission of a reduction of forces in Afghanistan. And so we, we had uh, probably about 200 people in Afghanistan there that were, again, doing construction all of the time, um, continuously um, over there. And so our brigade, our, our headquarters, was trying to control most of those operations um, from Kuwait. I think there are people in the audience that are here that, that played a significant part of, of that over there in some of those areas. And so um, so appreciate you all for, for that. But that was, that was probably our most recent, um, that was our most recent deployment that we did. And, um, and, and I have to say that they, that they did it and the troops did it all during COVID too, at the same time, with, with COVID be, being present, um, whether it was a quarantining for two weeks on a construction site to come home um, and whatnot, but uh, COVID slowed the world down, but the COVID did not stop the Army from doing its job. Captain Martin, would you tell us about your overseas deployment and your recent deployment to Bulgaria? Absolutely. <clears throat> so I was, I was the company commander for the HHC, and so I had a little more of a ground level. So Colonel Glandorf was the operations officer. You kind of had more of a 30,000 foot view. And being at, a, uh, being at a brigade, we've all been at the company level at some point, but being able to be at a brigade, you really see kind of how um, everything comes together. You know, how are we, how are we gonna accomplish this construction mission? But at a brigade level, you really kind of get a top-down view of what all it takes to accomplish these, you know, from logistics to personnel movement. And so, um, you know, hat, hats off to Colonel Glandorf and uh, Colonel Ross, who was our brigade commander for, you know, working from the top down to ensure that that happened. 
Um, so from a company view, you know, we had, we had 130, uh, we had 130 soldiers from our organic unit there. Uh, Mass Sergeant Turner, he was, he was, uh, in our, our, he was this, uh, NCOIC up in Iraq, did a phenomenal job, but, um, you know, we were, we were spread out and we were, we were managing construction operations and, and, uh, from Iraq to Saudi Arabia, all the way to Afghanistan and, uh, all centralized out of, out of Kuwait there. So, um, you know, we traveled, traveled a, a bit before COVID hit, and COVID kind of slowed everything down. But uh, but you know, we still got the mission done, and we still uh, we still got everybody there and brought everybody back. Lieutenant Graves is here as well. He was he was there. Um, so it was it was an interesting time. You know, on top of you know, we got there and we we dealt with the uh, the Iranian missile strike and some of the fallout from that. And uh, right on top of that, led in COVID, and we just saw a, a logistic slowdown. But but, you know, you still manage, you still find a way to get things done, and the, uh, the brigade headquarters absolutely ensured that, those, uh, that that was accomplished. You recently participated in the uh, uh, inauguration, didn't you? Why don't you tell us about that experience? So that was a, that was a unique experience. Uh, Tennessee National Guard was called on after, after the January 6th uh, incident at the Capitol, and uh, it was, it was a phenomenal effort from all the states. I think overall we had something like 25,000 uh, total National Guard members packed in right in there in D.C. Uh, about 750 of those came from the state of Tennessee, and uh, 150 came from the 194th. We got called up um, with a 48-hour notice to grab our gear, head to, the, head to the flight line, and we're going to D.C. So... One thing that, that 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 showed is that the state of Tennessee is absolutely available to to uh, handle whatever mission comes its way. We used purely Tennessee assets to get all 750 uh, service members there within a 48 hour 48 hour time frame. So that's everything from flights to logistics to everything, everything that was needed. We got there. So we were uh, we linked up with uh, Maryland and created a task force. I was the operations officer, a task force of about. Um, you know, 1,500 some odd soldiers, and we call it. We were task force senate, so we had a, a certain portion of the nation's capital to uh, to secure. And uh, you know, we got in there and and uh, you know made it happen. Linked up with uh, linked up with our higher headquarters, and uh, and we, you know, we're able to accomplish that mission. Tell us about your living conditions. What was depict, uh, depicted on the television was pretty austere and kind of. Uh, uh, sleeping in a parking garage. Tell, how did, I hope you weren't part of that. All right. Well, so I can say that we all know that the media sensationalizes a lot of things. And uh, I can't speak for any other task force's experience. I can't. I wasn't there. However, our experience was phenomenal. All right. We, we were initially housed in a, hot in a hotel that was right off the Capitol. They wanted us there quickly. We were a quick reaction force. And so they wanted us to be close by. Well, originally we were just in a hotel, uh, single-man rooms. Now, when it got closer to inauguration, yeah, we, we, we housed, housed ourselves there in one of the Senate buildings. We were never kicked out into a garage. We staged, we staged in garages, but we were never kicked out there when, when not on duty. Um, we were treated with respect by the senators and the congressional members that we came in contact with, and we had a, we had a phenomenal experience. They were, they were very happy that we were there and uh, treated us with respect. What was the reaction of the general public? The general public, by and large, was very, uh, very receptive, and they were happy that we were there. They were, you know, they were, most, most of the general public lives there, and they were there during the January 6th, and when that occurred, and, and, and they were uh, mostly open, you know, welcomed us with open arms. Obviously, there's going to be some outliers every once in a while, and that's to be expected, and you just, you just deal with it and, and roll on, but, but, uh, Pretty, I, I would say, by and large, very respectful, very happy that we were there. Uh, I'd also like to point point out that a majority of our uh, soldiers that were there weren't military police. They were not trained to do civil disturbance. So that kind of shows the flexibility that the National Guard has in, in, in being able to uh, adapt to whatever circumstance we had. You know, we got there and they're like, okay, here's your riot control gear. And we're like, riot control gear? Like, what, you know, what is this? Like, this is scary. And uh, but but uh, but you know we adapted. We had we had soldiers that had received prior, prior riot control training, and we set up a QRF, a quick reaction force. We trained those guys for hours and hours and hours on what to do in the event that this occurs, and uh, and, and and we you know we made it happen. And, and another portion of this is that you know 
our adjutant general is is uh, phenomenal in having trust in his in in, in his NCOs and and, and the non commissioned officers and we have phenomenal non commissioned officers in the 194th and and uh, you know when being asked okay you know how, how do we want to how do we want to face this you know do we want to go in with less lethal or do we want to go in with this you know. He said, you know, I want to equip my soldiers with what they need to get the job done. And that's a range of, you know, of, of tools there to ensure that you can get the job done. Lieutenant Officer, you've had a really a broad range of experience in, in your short time in the National Guard and that uh, you've been involved with the COVID-19 response and with tornado uh, relief program and also the, the hopefully didn't develop, but the possible civil disturbance in, uh, at the state capital in Nashville, Tennessee. Can you, can you tell us about your experience there? Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, so I'm Lieutenant Brittany Alsop. I've been in the National Guard three years now. I serve as a platoon leader for the 890th Sapper Company in Huntington. Um, starting last year, um, it was right after a drill weekend, the tornadoes hit Putnam and Wilson County very hard here in the state of Tennessee, and my unit was tasked with um, within, I think, 24 hours of getting all of our um, dump trucks and Humvees and things like that and as many bodies as we could to Putnam County to help with the tornado relief. Um, when we arrived, I was designated as the um, best way to put it, a liaison between the civilian counterparts there um, in Putnam County and then our military assets to be able to help facilitate debris cleanup. That was our main mission. Um, there was a few really hard impacted areas and a lot of debris that, you know, homeowners couldn't even get to their houses because the roads weren't cleared. And our main mission was just to go in and with um, all of our assets, load up the dump trucks and head to the landfill as many times as we possibly could a day. And within three weeks, um, it sounds like a long time, but it was a very long three weeks. And it took that long for us to only probably get 25% of the debris cleaned up um, but that was, to Putnam County, the most um, welcoming and the best thing that we could do for them. And the community themselves came together so great. It was, um, we were welcomed with open arms everywhere we went. Um, and that was during the time when COVID started to become an issue and um, people were just coming much more aware. And we were just happy to be able to be there and assist the community and what a lot of us signed up for was to give back to the state of Tennessee and for those state activations. Um, shortly after that ended, we went to Wilson County. One of the high schools um, was completely destroyed there and we helped in another area there. Same thing, debris cleanup, um, down trees, cutting them down, putting them in the dump trucks and just getting that stuff to the landfill. Um, we had about 130, I think, um, soldiers that responded to that and assisted both in Putnam and Wilson County. Shortly after that, um, the COVID response had really picked up, and there was a lot of people who were on the tornado mission that decided to stay on mission and help with the COVID response here in the state. Um, I was assigned to the state surgeon's office, and we were in the process of planning out how can we best assist in uh, the testing centers um, and getting set up with, you know, maybe it's local health departments and providing security or providing um, nurses to be able to conduct the testing and stuff like that for the public. So um, worked on coordinating that and across the state, and it was just um, incredible to see how as a, as a National Guard we can come together and really impact the community and help when it's needed. Um, shortly after that, we did have the um, riots um, would have been end of May, the riots uh, broke out in Nashville with um, the courthouse being put on fire and we were given about 12 hours to respond to Murfreesboro and be a part of a quick reaction force to go down to the state capitol um, and provide just, you know, presence really mostly um, and protection of the state capitol and anything there. And we partnered with THP uh, and I was on that mission for I think about three to four weeks help train um, a lot of incoming uh, soldiers and stuff like that. And shortly after that, uh, I served as the COVID compliance officer for um, the 117th MP Battalion. And my job was really to help units within the battalion and the brigade prepare to come back to training because we had been out of training so long um, just because of the concerns of exposure and everything like that. 
Uh, so I went into the units and helped them establish protocols and procedures and best practices for how we can still train and keep ourselves you know, ready to respond um, in the event that something else had happened or that we were needed. I've got a few questions I'm going to ask the panel members of myself, but does anyone in the audience, if you have a question that you want to ask the, any one of the panel members at any time, raise your hand and I'll try to recognize you. What were you going to say, Colonel? I was, I was going to... I was going to my microphone. I was going to, oh, thank you. I, I was going to ask, so, so you're not full-time in the National Guard, Lieutenant Alsop. So, so this all happened kind of a fluid transition, it seemed like. Um, so, so how was, uh, and I'm going to assume that you're early in your career with, with HCA. So, so how did you work that with your employer and, you know, while you were on deployments and whatnot and the support that you got from, from, from them for that? I will say I'm very blessed. Um, HCA, which for those of you that might not know, um, within the Nashville area or Chattanooga area, like TriStar, those are hospitals that are owned and operated by HCA. Um, I'm very blessed that my boss at the time was very transparent with me. I mean, I called him and gave him notice and said, hey, I won't be back to work and I don't know when I'm going to be back to work. Um, and my team, you know, picked up any of the work that I had going on and really hit the ground running with all of that so I didn't have that to worry about. Um, but they've been super supportive. Um, HCA has a long, uh, long, I guess, process as far as they want military and veterans and military spouses. We spend a lot of money to recruit um, that, those types of people because they just believe in what we do and understand the importance of it. And I was never once pressured to come back. I was never once, you know, made to feel like, oh, you're gonna lose your job if you don't come back. And so that was, it's a relief for me not to have to worry about that civilian side and I could really focus on what I could do within the, in the National Guard and how I could help. So, do you, have y'all had the same experience with your employers about uh, serving in the Guard? Absolutely, so, so a real blessing for a National Guard member, and active duty doesn't really have to deal with this, but for a National Guard member is uh, having an employer that supports what you do. And we are covered by uh, uh, USERA. USERA. We're covered by USERA that says that you know you can't be fired if if you're on you know if you're serving your country. However, you know there are employers that can make it difficult for you to do this. But um, you know one of the biggest blessings, you know, aside from having a familial structure that, that supports what you're doing, is having an employer that does the same. And it has been uh, I have had a phenomenal experience with my company, Security Bank Corp of Tennessee. And uh, you like to speak to that as well. Yeah, yeah, so, so I'm, a, I'm an employee of the state of Tennessee, and the state of Tennessee is, um, um, they try to set the example for how they support their military members um, when we're deployed overseas. So I, I am blessed to be able to work for the state um, and have their support, you know, in, in doing so um, with that. But, but you know, as, as Lieutenant also was, was, was um, alluding to is that it is, for National Guard members, it is a stressful transition between, you know, Monday I am doing uh, project management for, for this private corporation, I'm dealing with that, and, and my team doesn't know that the next day I was called by somebody like me or, or Cap Martin that says, hey, I need you to, you know, grab your gear, get your people, and we're going to go over here with dump trucks and, and start filling up debris. Um, and all the while, your, your team is still back there, you know, doing, doing the, the job that uh, they were doing uh, before you left. So, so to be able to have that, em, that employer support is just absolutely phenomenal to allow us to, to do the jobs that we need to do and, to, and have the focus that we need to have while, while we're on mission. Since we have an all-volunteer armed service, uh, what, what made you decide to, uh, to join the National Guard? So I, I joined the National Guard. Um, it, was, it was a little bit of a fluke is that um, while I was at college, um, do an orientation day. I think a lot of pe people in the military probably have that story that it wasn't an in necessarily intentional. Um, but uh, at, when I was at, uh, at college for orientation, um, my parents were with me and my stepfather had previously been in the Navy. And every, I think people would appreciate this story. Well, the Navy guy was at lunch. The Army guy brought a brown paper bag to eat out of. So <laughs> he was at the table. So that's the gentleman that I spoke to. So it was Army ROTC that I signed up for. And then uh, through ROTC, um, I signed up for the National Guard, and um, I had already had uh, thoughts of having a full-time job here in the state of Tennessee. Uh, when I graduated, I'm from Dyersburg, and so um, the National Guard seemed, uh, seemed a good option for me, and the people that I, I had previously worked with um, in Dyersburg had been in the National Guard and were in the National Guard, so I had a lot of uh, familial and friend influence to help me um, 
um, to transition into a career in, in the National Guard. And, um, and, and since joining the National Guard, there, it, it has been a part of my life every, every month uh, for the last 22 years. And I couldn't imagine not having the National Guard uh, as a part of my life as long as they will let me continue to be a part of the organization. Um, so mine probably isn't as much of a fluke, um, I guess. Uh, my dad had served in the Air Force and kind of growing up military and that life was always kind of just a part of who we were. I have two brothers that actually are active duty um, and serving, um, one in Washington and the other one at stationed here at Fort Campbell. And so it's just kind of always been a part of our family and things like that. I was the, the late bloomer, so to speak, joining a little bit later in life. Um, but for me, the reason I chose the National Guard over, you know, another component or maybe even going active duty was ever since I moved to Tennessee, um, you can really tell that people love the state of Tennessee. I don't think I've ever been anywhere that they love their state as much as this state. And for me, I wanted to be able to give back to the state in which I lived. And really to be able to do that, I felt like the Guard was the best way for me to do that. And I'd spoken to a lot of different people who... Ironically enough, had never been on a state active, you know, had never been state activated, and now in my short time, I've been activated, I think, three or four times to be able to give back and really be able to impact the community and give back to, you know, the state. So that's been great. So my, my, my family's always been real big in service, uh, community service and service to others. My brother is a, uh, he's a, he's still in, he's an active duty Navy, which, you know, we don't hold it against him, but, you know, it is a lesser branch. But that's okay. That's okay. So my family, my parents were big on community service. And so, you know, I'd gotten out of college and, um, and you know, I was kind of getting into my career and I thought, you know, I, there's something more. There's something that I want to do more. And, uh, and I'd always been interested in the military and uh, I just found it to be a way for me to, uh, you know, fur further my service to my community, my state, and my nation. And uh, I, I'll be honest, it's probably been the greatest, one of the greatest things I've ever done in my entire life. And, uh, and I... I hope, like, like Colonel Glanover, I hope to stay in as long as, um, I liked it so much that my wife joined. So that's, uh, <laughs> but uh, so and I'm, I'm proud of her and, and what she's accomplished as well in her military career. But it's, it's been a phenomenal choice. Yeah, and, I, and I will say for, for, from a service perspective is, is that what, you know, the, the why you serve and continue to do it is that, you know, I think for, for a lot of people, when you, when you start to become a part of something that's bigger than yourself, and then there's this, you know, this light that kind of clicks on at some point in time that you're part of this extremely large living, uh, you know, organization, and that has a positive benefit at the end of the day, you, you start to kind of become, you know, you get some, uh, some intrinsic value of being part of, of that larger organization. And to think of yourself as being without that is a difficult thing to, to come to terms with. So I think a lot of the service grows on you over time because you it, it starts to become a part of your identity, kind of what you do, similar that you cannot necessarily, um, you, know, you, you may be a part of a family. There is a family that you help to identify with. So it, it becomes a, a part of you and then it becomes a part of your family. So um, so I know that the, the things that, that, we're, that we do or that we're asked to do, um, there's not, there's never a look for a a net positive benefit individually to yourself. So you're not looking to come out of it that you've gained something from that. Really, it's it's how much can it, how much can you give that helps to benefit others um, in some kind of like a life balance that you may have um, um, out there. So I think I think um, you know keeping keeping the idea of, of service in the back of your mind that it's it's not necessarily for you. It's for somebody else. But what, what you gain is to be a part of a, of a family, of an organization. I think that's the, that's the benefit that, that you get out of it. It's something that's absolutely deep inside yourself and probably deep inside your, your own family. Um, and, and I think that's what, what keeps, for me, that's what keeps me, me going month to month and day to day. National Guard members have to serve for at least 20 years to get retirement benefits, which you, you quite different from the, from the uh, active army. So. Uh, do you, all of you have hope and plan that you're going to be able to serve out for 20 years or more? I, I do. Good, good. Yes, sir. Uh, I was both active duty and Army Reserve, but uh, how is recruiting going now, and how many are prior service versus new recruits? 
So, uh, you know, I, I'll say this. The state legislature just gave a big boost in the arm to recruiting and re-upping what, what's called the Strong Act, and that is, a, uh, that's, that is uh, additional educational benefits for soldiers that want to come in. So it extended the Strong Act. Uh, I think it was House Bill 83, but it ex extended the Strong Act um, another till 2025, but it also opened up master's degrees. So when, uh, you know, we had the Strong Act put through and then the Tennessee Promise came along and, and it kind of made it a little more difficult to, to promote this. Well, now we're able to, to uh, have the same benefits as the Tennessee Promise as well as open it up for master's degrees. So um, I think recruiting, we have recruiters here today, um, but I think we're, we're probably improving from where we were, you say, four years ago. It's it's um it's an ebb and flow, you know. I think I think personnel wise, it is it is an ebb and flow, and so um, we do get a lot of um, prior service people uh, coming out of usually like the Fort Campbell area or whatnot. We've had a lot of we've had a lot of that, and our brigade actually has a I, I think a good relationship of the engineers up there at Fort Campbell, and we do some training with them and and with the Fifth Special Forces group that's up there. Um, and so, and so, we try to make ourselves known out there that hey, when you get out of active duty, there's there's a thing that you can do if you're going to remain in the Clarksville area, or something else like that. You can you can kind of come and serve with us. And I think one of one of my uh, best friends in the National Guard that I've been serving with for 12 years, um, he is a previous West Point graduate, uh, did five years five years active duty, and he came in over into Tennessee, and he's in the National Guard with us now. And and if he was here, he'd say that he he enjoys. Uh, being a part of our organization, um, from I think from a recruiting standpoint, w more recently we have issues people staying in longer. So we may get somebody for their initial term, and then they they want to leave after their initial term with the with the National Guard. Um, and so I think it's difficult for young people nowadays to see that long term benefit or understand, you know, that long term benefit that if you do 20 years in the National Guard, then when you turn age 60, you have medical benefits available to you that is not available to the remainder of everybody else that's in the United States. And 20-year uh, service in the National Guard on, on weekend goes by very, very quickly. Um, and it's not just for you, but it's, it's, it's for your family. So we do have difficulty doing that because we're still recruiting into the National Guard. We just have to replace people more often because they're, they're getting out um, at, you know, at earlier times or whatnot. And there's pl plenty of reasons for that. It's difficult I think for people nowadays in their career to stay either in one place or in one state for any period of time. So we do have a lot of interstate transfers uh, I know that are that are going on out there. But but what we try to do is we try to make it, we try to show everyone not just that short term but that long term benefit of of staying in the National Guard and, and the service that you can you know that you can provide and and kind of what that mutual benefit is. All right, so. So do you all have any uh, ideas for like, sedative weapons, non-lethal, going on right now? Because I, what? I had an idea. I'm sorry, it kind of sounds like this all the way through. Sure, okay. Um, do you all have any ideas for like a uh, non-lethal, semi-auto sedative weapons to use for riots, control riots? Cause, cause like you know those uh, trank darts, those are, can be bigger than small little sedative darts, which there'll be like a little tube sedative, or when when I reach contact on a victim, it'll inject the sedative through the needle, and after a little bit, they'll pass out. In a non lethal way. Okay. So, so, yeah, so we do have the non lethal weapons. So, we do have our engineer brigade actually has two battalions of military police. Uh, one of them specializes in that type of um, uh, riots, or, uh, you know, riot um, and uh, riot control. And so they do have the non-lethal weapons that you're talking about. They shoot out the rubber bullets or the bean bags and, and things like that. And so, and so when we when they secured the Capitol, um, those units that have those, they brought both they brought both of those things. Hey, we 
We have, um, we're going to bring live rounds and then we're going to use those non, bring the non-lethal rounds at the same time. Um, because you never, you, because you have to, you would have to, being in the military, you'd have to trans, you may have to transition at one point in time. And I think, um, I think we, we did a great job of, of sticking with um, all of the, the, the non -lethal, we'll just call it non-lethal communication you can have with people that are rioters out there because a lot of it is more than the weapon that you're showing or whether or not you have bean bags or rubber bullets or things like that. But I think a, a lot of it has to do with what is your body language conveying to somebody that's standing across from you? Are you conveying that you're being stoic or whatnot? Are you just conveying that we are protecting this area and, and you have your ability and your right to do your protest where you're at um, and so we always like to keep it on the, the, in the area of, um, of having the, the um, you know, escalation of force at the lowest level that we, that we can have it out there. Um, I've not heard of an, of an injector, though, like you were talking about, that could possibly inject and pass out. I haven't, I haven't heard of that one. Go on over here, sir. Pardon me? Hi. Sorry. Could you all speak a little bit about the challenges and also the rewards that your families, your spouses, and children may experience as part of your military service? Well, I mean, it definitely can be a, uh, a challenge, I think, for, you know, having a you know, we're in a little bit different situation because she's also in, but, but there was a time before she wasn't, and it was, it, was a, uh, it was a challenge at times. You know, I'm gone for long extended periods of time, but, but you know, that support structure of, of having, having her there was, you know, is phenomenal, and, and it always takes, when you're gone at all, there's always kind of an adjustment period, you know, to uh, whether you're gone for, you know, six weeks or six months or a year, uh, there's always kind of an adjustment period after you leave and then, you know, kind of while you're gone and then after you get back. But the, the military does a great job of, uh, and I don't know how it was in years past, but they do, do a great job of having, you know, family programs. And uh, the J-9 is at our state level, um, does all the family assistance and, uh, and active duty has that as well. But the National Guard has kind of come on par in recent years to, uh, ha you know, have it. And I don't know recent years. I know for me, I've seen it increase being able to reach out to families and, and, and see how you are. Hey, do you need anything? You know, your husband or wife are, are deployed. You know, your, your air conditioner goes out. Do you know how, you know, do you know, you know who to reach out to at state to uh, help you get a new air conditioner? Because you may not be the person that knows how to handle that. And uh, they've, they've definitely opened up resources um, to, to, to assist families in the event of, your, of a deployment. Yeah, so I, I, I've been in since before 9-11, before we started all of our, um, all of our, I guess, last 20 years of deployments that we've had. And my, my wife has gone through two deployments with me. The, the most recent one, I, we just got back home in October, roughly September, probably September. Um, and, so, and so that's the second deployment she went, she went through with me. And, uh, you know, your, your family support is, is one of the most important things you can have that keeps you in the military. And it's also your family is the one thing that is always, it is always the balance between the, the time in the military and the time with your family. Um, because the military will take one thing away from you that you can, you can, never, take, you can never get back, which is time. Um, and, so, and so we do, um, uh, you know, in, in, the la years, in the years, recent years, there's been a lot of um, communication within the military, within the National Guard about making best use of your time when you have your family around. So having quality time is, is, is the word for it, you know, with your family. But we're also, we also talk about, you know, emotions, feelings, and understandings. So you have to be able with your family to communicate how you are feeling, um, especially with your spouses when you've been gone or deployed for a year and you haven't seen them. How are they feeling? How are you feeling? And have a, a shared communication, um, you know, between you two so that so that, um, you know, when people get back from deployments, you don't just go back to the way it was, because the way it was is gone. You'll never get that back. It is now a new way. It's a new way, and you have to be able to um, adapt to that new way. And I think for, for soldiers and for soldiers' families, we, we all go through this culture shock when we, re, when we deploy, you know, right after we're gone, and then when, when we come back. There's always that normalcy in the middle, and I think 
um, for soldiers, a lot of times you have more difficulty um, coming back um, with your family than you had trying to adapt to being, you know, overseas in those living conditions or whatnot, um, because um, because you've been you've been gone so far so long. There is a um, there is a different dichotomy between who runs the household now, who pays the bills, um, who's doing what for the kids, who's uh, you know the the silverware is now in this drawer, not that drawer because it's more efficient like this. Um, so these are the things that that, that we run into, but. Um, but I think the family support is probably the most important thing that we have um, that allows us to continue to do our jobs. And it is, a, and it is, a, it is definitely a burden on the family, um, but it is something that the burden can be alleviated um, if both the military member and, and the spouse and the family all have an open communication as to what are their feelings, what are their expectations, and what are their needs, and that everybody is trying to um, strive to, to help each other out you know, to, to accomplish those things. So, yeah. Absolutely. And the state, the state, like I said before, you know, it has phenomenal resources for service members when they come home. You know, if you were to have, um, you know, there was no question who, who ran the house while before I left or when I got home. It didn't change. <laughs> but but uh, but, you know, there, there are um, behavioral health officers and, and, and uh, those at, at the state level that are available to families in the event that, you know, they're, they need counseling post uh, post deployment, and they do a great job making sure that, that those resources are available. The only thing I was going to say is, uh, you know, God bless my mom because she's got her three oldest are all in some form, and I don't think all of us kids have been back together in almost six years now. It has been since we've all been able to be home for either a Christmas or whatever it might be. Um, but also with that is it was something you alluded to earlier, sir, about, you know, it's kind of like we have to flip a switch. You know, we have to, be, you know, go from a role of um, being in this uniform and being in this, you know, whatever position we're in. And then we go home and we go back to civilian life and back with our families. And we, we're not somebody different, but we have a different role that we play. And we, uh, in active duty, I think maybe it's a little bit easier, right? Because that's their everyday job. That's their everyday life. They, they come accustomed to being on post and being surrounded by people who are going through something similar. And in the Guard, it's a little bit unique. Um, I'm a dual military household as well, and so it's, you know, what you were talking to when you're talking about, well, whose responsibility is it to do something? And we joke a lot of times that, you know, it, it's easy to be in the, the Army life because they tell us where to be and when to eat and what to wear and all of that stuff, and we have to one focus, and that's on the mission. Whereas being at home, life happens. Things happen, cars break down, and, you know, air conditioners stop working or whatever it might be. And that's where the real challenge becomes. And so we have to really remember that what we might be going through and what we might be dealing with is probably nothing about what our families are going through at home. And keeping that communication open and just being appreciative of the things that they're doing at home and how they're doing it with probably out even telling us about it. And they're just taking care of it so we can stay focused. And so huge shout out to all of our families and loved ones that you know put up with us and take care of us when we come back and everything like that. That you can tell. <laughs> so I'm glad. So Colonel Bishop originally uh, was the one who, who kind of asked asked me to be in General Castle. I'm glad Colonel Bishop wasn't here because he was my uh, brigade commander um, back when I was a young second lieutenant. And boy, he has some stories about me that, that we can't tell up here. But uh, we went through uh, Resolute Castle. Uh, so this is a this is a phenomenal thing about the National Guard is that you know you do have, you get to have a a um, you know, you do get to have a civilian career, but you also get to experience things that you would never get to experience, um, you know, while having a civilian career if you weren't in the National Guard. But we, we, uh, so we have a NATO partnership. Uh, the state of Tennessee does has a NATO partnership with uh, the country of Bulgaria. So, so we, uh, which is which is in Eastern Europe, if you don't know, it used to be a former Soviet uh, bloc. And so I was a young lieutenant, came straight out of came out of OCS, went through Bolik. And like two months later, I'm on a C-17 flying to Bulgaria. No clue what I'm doing, right? 
So it was called Operation Resolute Castle, uh, 2015 and 2016. And so, uh, you know, we land there in uh, Sliven or somewhere, and, uh, you know, they truck us out in the middle of the night out to this range, and uh, it's a NATO training site. Well, it was built on top of, a, uh, of an old former Soviet training site. And so, you know, coming straight out of your basic officer leadership course as a 20-something-year-old and, and, and then just being told, hey, here's your 40 guys, you know, go out here and build these roads. And you're like, I have no clue what I was doing. It absolutely is, was a unique experience, but it was also a uh, what in the heck am I doing experience, too. You have no clue. You're just some young kid trying to tell guys that have been in the military for 20 years how to do their jobs, and uh, most of them are like, oh, okay, LT. So, so um, from an officer side, being given that, that, uh, you know, that level of responsibility um, was, was an absolutely unique experience, and we were there in 15. We went back in 16, and uh, I actually saw two years ago the United States Army posted a uh, kind of an update of that training site, and uh, they're using it, and uh, you kind of get you kind of get to see the the fruition of of, of those two years of work um, played out because they're now using it for uh, M1 Abram training. It was it was awesome. I think for for me, there's a couple things that stand out. It's a great question, by the way, because you stumped us all because there's you know you're just going through years of memories of like oh the most unique. I don't know this is. So, because um, I think a lot of things that we do are stand out from, from normal day-to-day -day life. I think, for me, um, in 2000, 2005, I was in Iraq um, um, at Talil Air Base in, in southern Iraq, and we had the opportunity of going um, and having a dinner um, with a local, um, I'm not sure if he was a cleric, but he was definitely uh, influential in the area, and so it was always important to go and do um, key engagements with key people in in the area, and so um, I remember we went into their into their house, and it was actually just a, an offshoot room, and only the men were there. And I remember, uh, so we, we were eating dinner, and we had the you know the cushions, and you sit on the floor, and the person of most prominence is at the very far edge of the room, and then um, their you know their their level of, of ranking slowly dwindled down to where you had the children in the doorway, you know, kind of standing in there and all of that. And so I, I remember eating, eating dinner with them. And then when we got done eating dinner, um, we were washing our hands and the kids kind of help you wash your hands. And so that's like the only, that was the only interaction that we had that, that day was um, with, the, with the children, you know, the, the boys and girls that were probably from, you know, seven to, to 10 years old and whatnot. And, and when you were in Iraq, unless you were outside, you know, of a base every day, you really didn't get to interact with a lot of people and then more or less children, unless you're on a construction site and they were, you know, just kind of more or less tr um, trying to come around and see, you know, what candy or things that you had to give to them. Um, but, but I remember when we were, you know, washing hands with the kids and all of that is that, you know, no matter, it seems like no matter what country a kid is from, what their ethnicity is, they always give you the same look, you know? Between that age of seven and 10, where they're excited to see you or excited to, to help you out, they have the same look. And so I, I don't know what it is, uh, what, it was, uh, what it was about them, but for me, it just kind of re resonated out there is that, you know, you know we're, we were in a country where, you know, the United States military is the one that decided, you know, the, what is the rule of law at, at that point in time. And so, uh, you know, kind of looking and I was like, wow, you know, like, like you know, we're, we're kind of wholly responsible for this country. And there's that kid with that smile that's there. So it really, it really brings you home. But just being able to, to see and communicate with somebody, even though we spoke uh, not even close to the same languages, was, was probably one of the, the, the best eye-opening experiences for me. Oh, now I have to go <laughs> after those. Two. Um, well, I would say probably for me was the tornado relief, um, getting to see the impact that we could have on the community and stuff like that, and just how welcoming they were, even though they were the ones going through it all. Um, they were so forthcoming, bringing us tons of food and just anything that we needed or anything like that, and we were all just worried about them. Um, and so getting to see that it, you know, be around the guys and see how much work that they were putting in and how much it really meant. I think for me, that was probably the most unique thing that I've been a part of um, so far. Did you have a question down here on the front row? Okay. 
Uh, can you all talk about any current missions that are uh, on the books that you're looking at in the near future? Uh, certainly if they're not classified, you can't talk about them, but if they're unclassified, can you tell us what uh, the future is? Yeah. So, so um, yeah, a great thing I think that we're doing within the state is that our, uh, our brigade, or specifically our engineer battalion out of Trenton, Tennessee, and, and it includes here the, the engineers here at Union City, uh, the 913th, um, we've created some, uh, like a small partnership with the Tennessee State Parks where we're trying to assist them at building bridges on, in state parks, uh, specifically over in the Middle Tennessee area. I know that the, that the Tennessee Department of uh, Environment and Conservation is trying to link a lot of these uh, uh, hiking trails and, and trailways together to make one continuous trail throughout the state of Tennessee. They have to buy up some land or whatnot. But we we've helped them put in bridges, and, and when I say we're put in bridges, this is not a this is this is not a small thing. This is a pretty interesting task. So they have these all aluminum bridges that they are putting in some of the most remote areas of Tennessee, and we are putting them, you know, 20, 30 feet over waterways, um, uh, securing them from one boulder to another, and we're we're doing it, or we've done it in the past, uh, using these aluminum bridges that they bought called Gator bridges. Uh, we use Black Hawk helicopters to actually airlift in the pieces of bridges, the bags of cement. Um, we we helped uh, they helped partner to get um, to get um, uh, people that that um, can actually create winches and high lines um, across boulder faces to create zip lines to bring in like the concrete bags, the bridging pieces, and whatnot. And so. And so that's one of my, my favorite missions that we've done because it benefits people within the state of Tennessee um, to be able to explore their parks, to have safe bridges that connects all of these trails together in these areas that people otherwise wouldn't have been able to go to or the trail just ends and you turn around and go back. Um, and, and so it helps out people in the state of Tennessee and it helps us in our engineering because it makes us think outside of the box. We're not just going to you know, put up a building on a nice flat piece of ground. You know, we're going to get out there, you know, in a remote area. We get to live in our life fighters and, you know, um, and get to, you know, listen to hear if there's wild hogs out there that are starting to raid our coolers at night or whatever. So, um, so that's, one of, uh, that's one of the most fun uh, missions, I think, that we've had um, in the last couple of years. And I think we're going to start doing some in the, in the next couple of years also. Any, uh, any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Uh, I wondered if you had any work that you do with VA cemeteries. I know at times they have budget constraints and they could use a little bit of maybe a pathway or something like that, a concrete pathway so people can move around better. If you ever do it, any work like that with uh, VA? No, not not that I'm aware of. We've we've not uh, been asked to, to to make any improvements out there on the on the VA cemeteries. I live close to one in middle, in the one that's in Middle Tennessee, and and no, uh, haven't been done a part of that. Other than um, our the funeral services that we've done, we so we definitely have a a group of people that, that assist in the, the funeral honors uh, for those at the cemetery, but, but no, but you do bring up, I think, a really good opportunity for us. Any, uh, anything further? To your military jobs, <laughs> and I was wondering, where did you obtain the training to be engineering officers if you so, did not get that before you enlisted. So the question is, uh, none of us have civilian jobs that, that relate to engineering. And that's, that's, I've been asked that quite a bit, actually. And it is a, it's, you're, it's a crash course, I'll tell you. So, so I, I got a degree in finance and economics, and I'm a banker. So, um, you know, so how did, how did you pick, why did you pick engineering? And I get that a lot. And, and I, I started out kind of on the horizontal side, which is dozers and graders and all that. And I, I was really, really into uh, combat engineering, and that's that's kind of where my specialty is. That's where my bread and butter. She's actually P platoon leader over at a sapper unit, which is a combat engineer unit. But go back to your question. So you go to your basic officer leadership course, which is between five to six months uh, at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, and uh, you know you're there with your. So some of your classmates are West Pointers and Citadel. Some of them are ROTC. Some are OCS. 
and some of them are engineers and a lot of them aren't. And you are run through the ringer of, uh, of, of basic engineering and project management. So, so you know, you don't, you, you really learn how to follow kind of a, you know, project, more of a project management standpoint, but you have to know some of those fine things. Uh, when you get into your career and either you're a first lieutenant or you make captain right now, I'm in the middle of what's called our captain's career course. And uh, it's another engineering course. And, uh, and it's very, very detailed and very, and you, you know, you learn things you thought you'd never know. And uh, you, you feel, especially from a non-engineer standpoint, you feel so dumb, but you know, you make it. And, uh, and, and so the Army does a great job of preparing non-degree engineers to take engineer units and be successful with them. Yeah, I think, I mean, exactly what you said. I'm a, I was an economics undergraduate, um, and then um, later, after I was in the, uh, already in the National Guard, I went to law school and became an attorney. But um, I, I would say that, like, if one thing it teaches you, regardless of what school it is, is that if you want to be effective leader, you got to be able to use your people and you'll use the uh, you know, use the assets that you have. And so, I think, at least in the Tennessee Guard, we have a very strong um, NCO core, and they absolutely are are technical experts in their field, especially when it, when it comes to construction, whether it be um, vertical construction or, or u- utilizing heavy equipment. And I think. The, the thing that I've learned being in, in the same brigade for the last 22 years is that you have to be able to trust um, your NCOs to let them do their job. Um, but then you have, as a leader, you have to be able to understand and set the priorities of work, what are the standards of work, um, and you have to be able to take care of your soldiers' needs so that they can do their job, which is also includes removing the obstacles that keep them from doing the job that they, that they need to do. Um, we do have technical engineers within our brigade. So if we were going to design an item or something like that, we have people in the audience here who can help us um, do, 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 exactly, do exactly that. So, um, um, so that, that is an, that it's, it's a, one of the most interesting concepts is that, is that uh, to be an engineer in the National Guard, you do not have to be um, school trained um, um, in, a civilian, in the civilian side. Uh, the military can give you all of the schooling and training um, you know, that you need to be successful. So uh, I misidentified him. He's Captain Graves now. He actually de- uh, was the designer for the entire water system at uh, Al-Assad Air Base while we were deployed in Iraq. He did a phenomenal job. So we do have those, uh, we do have those officers that are degreed, and, uh, and they kind of pick up the slack where some of us who are non- non-degreed engineers who are more on the project management side, uh, you know, l- lacking some of that knowledge. While we're talking about military education, I, I came aware that uh, Colonel Glandorf has just been accepted to the United, United States Army War College. So tell us a little, what, you, what do you expect there, sir? <laughs> so, so they've been telling me it's about two years worth of reading, and I don't get to do a vacation in between. So, um, yeah, so the United States Army War College is the it's the last uh, it's it's the last formal education I can go through um, in the military um, outside of some more specialties out there, and so. Um, it's really on the strategic side. Uh, it's something that um, not not many people get selected for it. It's it's uh, more strategic involved, higher level uh, viewing and thinking of uh, of higher level problems at the national level and how you deal with those problems or or um, or in you know throughout uh, whether it be a military operation or something that's ancillary related to it. So. Uh, so I look forward. I look forward to being able to do that, and I laugh while I say it because everybody says that it's a it's a two year. It's you end up getting a master's degree in it, so it is a two years course um, that does take a lot of time. And I'll be doing that outside of regular National Guard drill, and outside of my um, outside of my civilian career. So, so I look forward to it, but I know that it is going to be a a tough course. We're just about out of time, but we have, we have time for maybe one or more two questions. If anyone has one, yes, sir. Just a, just a second. What was your first war? What did he say? What was your first war? My <laughs> first war. What was your hey, What was your first war? Yeah, it was in Iraq in 2000, 2004. In, in Iraq, um, in Talil, Iraq, a long time ago. Uh, anyone else? 
All right, well, thank you very much for your participation. Our time is up, and uh, I want to thank these fine soldiers for coming here and participating. Let's give them a big round of applause.